स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया In the last lecture, we discussed isometries on the complex plane. Isometries were distance-preserving complex-valued functions, which were defined on the entire complex plane. Throughout this course, we will be interested in studying complex-valued functions, which are defined on open-connected uh, subsets of the complex plane. So we shall refer to open-connected subsets. of the complex plane by the word domain or region we shall refer by domain or region both these words will mean the same thing uh, open connected subsets of c let's now look at Uh, function f from omega into c uh, where omega is a domain in c so let f from omega into c be a function complex valued function as you can see defined on a domain or a region omega in c so when i say this it means that omega is an open subset of c which is also connected and f is a function on omega which takes values in the complex plane for every z in omega f of z is a complex number and because of that because of uh, f of z being a complex number we can define two further functions the moment we are given such a function define u of z to be the real part of f of z for z in omega and v of z is defined to be the imaginary part of f of z for z in omega then we can write f as u of z plus i times v of z which is sometimes captured by the expression f is equal to u plus iv let's look at uh, some very basic examples because we are going to study all types of uh, such examples but let's study uh, the polynomials first or rather let's look at the polynomials as the first example consider p from c to c given by P of z is equal to a zero plus a one z plus up to a d z to the power d. Notice that now we are not looking at this as a formal uh, polynomial. Rather, we are looking at it as a function from c to itself. For every complex number z, we are looking at P of z, which is the complex number given by a zero plus a one times z plus a two times z square. adding it up to ad times z to the power d notice that the right hand side is a complex number so this is a polynomial in z and uh, because c can be identified with r2 we could also think of this as p of x comma y okay since uh, c can be identified with r2 we have z is say x plus i y and thus p of x p of z can be thought of as a polynomial in these two variables and which is captured in p1 of x y plus i times p2 of x y so you can think of a polynomial in z as a polynomial in x of y with a real part and a imaginary part both of which turn out to be polynomials with real coefficients 
A thing to note here is that uh, not every polynomial in x, y can be realized as a polynomial in z, just z. So, for example, if uh, p of x, comma y is equal to just the uh, first uh, variable x, this is a polynomial in x, comma y, but notice that uh, if you write it in terms of z then we have p of z is going to be equal to z plus z bar by 2 and this is not a polynomial just in z there is a z bar featuring it. So, you cannot write necessarily every polynomial uh, polynomial in x y as a polynomial in z that is to be kept in mind. We will come back to all this again. So, polynomials in z are uh, a good class of examples we would be interested in. Uh, another example would be of uh, rational functions. Let us see. Mm, let p, uh, let f of z be, or rather, let p of z and q of z be polynomials which do not have a common factor with no common factor, in particular no common zeros. And let us capture all the uh, zeros of all the roots of the polynomial q and let z of q be equal to the set of all those points in the complex plane such that uh, q of z is equal to 0. Remember that uh, q of z is a polynomial, it has a degree say d, then the number of points where q vanishes of counting multiplicities will be less than or equal to d, there cannot be more than d points in z of q. If we define omega to be the complement of z of q, notice that z of q is a closed set. Why? Because q is a continuous map and q inverse of a closed set will be a closed set and therefore z of q is just q inverse of 0 and hence a closed set. And therefore z minus sorry c minus z of q is an open set in the complex plane. That means omega is an open is an open subset of c. It is also uh, not a difficult check to see that omega is a connected subset of C because you are only removing finitely many points. It is very easy to show that any two points in C minus z of q can be connected by a path. The idea would be to get hold of a path in C which connects any two points and then if it passes through one of these points uh, in z of q. In a neighborhood of z, of z of q, you perturb the path in such a manner that it avoids uh, the point in z of q and you can always construct one such path uh, from a given point to another and therefore this is going to be by the characterization of connectedness we have always, uh, we have uh, proved in the last week a connected subset of C as well. Let me just say that open subset of C which is connected. Let us define R a function from omega into C given by R of z to be equal to P of z by Q of z and such a function is called a rational function. These are also uh, a class of functions which are of great interest such a function is called a rational function. We will next uh, study some very specific functions which are of great importance and of great interest in the uh, study of complex analysis. Mm, but before we come to that, uh, let us also recall a few notions of convergence which are very essential uh, in, in the study uh, of these functions. The first one is that of uniform convergence. Let me not spend too much time, these are all uh, notions which you would have already seen. 
let me just give you a definition and uh, go uh, forward. So, let omega be an open subset. Let omega be any subset. Let omega be contained in C and f comma f n from omega into C be a collection of functions defined on omega. We say that uh, the sequence f n of functions converges uniformly to f if given an epsilon positive there exists an n large enough such that f n of x is close to f of x epsilon close to f of x irrespective of uh, the point x. Let me write that down. We say that the, where the n is not dependent on x that is what I meant when I said irrespective of the point x. So, we say that f n the uh, sequence or the sequence f n converges to f uniformly on omega if absolute value if given epsilon positive there exists some n in natural numbers such that the absolute value of f n of x minus f of x is less than epsilon for all x in capital X and n greater than or equal to capital N. So, this n does not de depend on x, the point x, it just depends on epsilon. Given an epsilon, we have a capital N such that the distance of f n x to f of x is less than epsilon for all x in, not x in omega. By the way, to define a uniform convergence, we did not need to demand that omega is a subset of C. We could have defined uniform convergence on uh, any metric space, uh, complex valued functions on any metric space, we could have defined this. All the, I uh, will be assuming all the usual uh, results that uh, uh, follow after the definition. For example, let me just note it as an exercise. Uh, if f n s are a sequence or uh, it is a sequence of continuous functions on omega which uniformly converge converges to a function say f. Conver on omega which converges uniformly. to a function f on omega. Then let me rephrase it, let us start with a the let. Then f is a continuous function on omega. This is that standard argument uh, by using triangle inequality and splitting it into three, uh, in three terms picked in the right manner. We also have the standard Weierstrass M test, for example. If, uh, for example, f n is a, a function such that the the uh, mod of f n of x is less than some m n for uh, m n positive real numbers, and suppose for all for every x, and suppose summation m n is a series which converges, then the series summation f n also converges. All those things do uh, get carried forward here. I would also like to recall the notion of absolute convergence. We will uh, discuss or recall the definition of uh, absolute convergence of a series of complex numbers. So, we say that a series summation Zn converges absolutely if uh, the series summation absolute value of Zn converges. The word absolute is coming from here. 
n equal to 0 to infinity or 1 to infinity. It does not matter. Let me put 1 for consistency. Converges. It is a very strong notion of convergence in the sense that if a series converges absolutely, then the series itself converges and not just uh, uh, normal convergence, it's, it converges uh, unconditionally. You look at any permutation of the series, it will still converge to the same limit. So, this is a very strong notion of convergence. Let us next uh, define a very important function in, in the study of complex analysis, namely the complex exponential. So, complex exponential. In a course in real analysis, uh, you would have seen the exponential function. Recall that uh, x from r to r is the exponential function is a function which is given by, whose Taylor series is given by summation x to the power n by n factorial. So, let me just write that recall that the exponential, the real exponential x from r to itself is a function whose Taylor series is given by x of z, uh, x of x is equal to summation x to the power n by n factorial where n is from 0 to infinity. You would have seen that the uh, a real exponential is uh, for every x in capital R, this series that is just written to the right hand side here, this is an absolutely convergent uh, series. So, x of x is absolutely convergent for every x in R. Let us define the complex exponential by mimicking this Taylor series expansion. Let us define it as a series uh, which is very similar to this. Let us define the complex exponential yet again we will just call it x x is now from c to itself given by x of z is defined to be summation n is equal to 0 to infinity z to the power n by n factorial. The fact that uh, summation x to the power n by n factorial converges absolutely tells us that for every z this series converges absolutely. For every z in C, x of z converges absolutely. That is something which we get for free from uh, the theory developed on the real line. The exponential, the complex exponential also satisfies uh, uh, some properties which are very similar to the real exponential. So, let me note it as an exercise to prove that the, so okay, let us denote by e to the power z the exponential function, let us denote by this shorthand notation. The function x power z and the exercise is to show that e to the power z plus w is equal to e to the power z times e to the power w. So, the proof is actually uh, quite similar. It crucially uses the fact that the series e to the power z converges absolutely and by an application of uh, Merton's theorem, this tells us that e to the power z plus w is equal to e to the power z times e to the power w by considering the Cauchy product. Let us next study the trigonometric analogs of the trigonometric uh, functions that is defined on the complex uh, on the real line. So, again next is trigonometric uh, functions uh, 
again I'll start by recalling that the sine and cosine functions are given have a Taylor series given by sine of x is equal to summation minus of 1 to the power n x to the power 2n plus 1 by 2n plus 1 factorial where the series is from 0 to infinity. So, this is basically the power the Taylor series given by uh, x by x minus x square uh, x cube by 3 factorial plus x to the power 5 by 5 factorial and so on. And we also have a uh, Taylor series expansion for the cosine function. Cos of x was basically uh, 1 minus x square by 2 factorial plus x to the power 4 by 4 factorial and so on. So basically this is summation n equal to 0 to infinity uh, x minus 1 to the power n x to the power 2n by 2n factorial. Now let us look at the, the, the function exponential at the point ix. So e to the power ix is basically summation ix to the power n by n factorial where n goes from 0 to infinity. And because the series is uh, convergent unconditionally, we can write this as cos of x plus i times sin of x. If you write down the explicit form and gather the terms, you would see that this is equal to cos of x plus i times sin of x. And that is precisely, so this is for, for x in R. And this is precisely the collection of points on the unit circle that we had described in the previous lecture. So, e to the power i theta, hence e to the power i theta for theta in R uh, are points on the unit circle. Recall that any point on the unit circle, we do have some theta such that e to the power i theta is, is the point uh, on the unit circle and the set of all those thetas we captured as the argument of the point z. And for every such theta e to the power i theta is equal to cos of theta plus i sin theta which is a point on the unit circle. So, these are the points on the unit circle which are uh, written in the form of uh, e to the power i times x where x is in real numbers. The trigonometric, the usual trigonometric uh, properties tell us that e to the power 2 pi i is equal to 1. So, this is uh, for you to check that the straightforward checks actually e to the power pi i is equal to minus 1, e to the power i times pi by 2 is equal to i and so on. So these are all directly trigonometric uh, identities which you will uh, already be familiar with. Also, the uh, product rule above tells us that this is e, the product of two such points e to the power i theta and e to the power i phi. So, it is going to be e to the power i theta plus phi. This is exactly the same thing which we had seen earlier in the last lecture. This is basically cos theta plus i sin theta, this is cos phi plus i sin phi, and this is cos of theta plus phi plus i times uh, sin of theta plus phi. Also, the conjugate of e to the power i theta, you should sit down and check that this is equal to e to the power minus i theta. All these are exercises which you should uh, sit and solve. Right. With this, let us now try to describe the sine and cosine functions in terms of the complex exponential. So, notice that the cosine function happens to be the real part of e to the power uh, i theta right or e to the power i x. So, notice that cos of x and how did we define the real part? It was z plus z bar by 2. 
this is going to be e to the power ix this complex number plus the, the conjugate which is going to be e to the power minus of ix by 2 and similarly sine of x is equal to e to the power this is the imaginary part this is e to the power ix minus e to the power minus of ix by 2 times i. So notice that this is a function from r to r and let us define the complex trigonometric functions cos and sin by using the same formula. So, let us now define the complex trigonometric functions. Sin from C to itself and cos from C to itself given by sin of, let me start with cos of z, cos of z is equal to e to the power i z plus e to the power minus of i z by 2 and sin of z is defined as e to the power i z minus e to the power minus i z by 2 i. This is basically the formula for the imaginary part. The complex trigonometric uh, functions satisfy um, the similar algebraic properties uh, as the uh, real trigonometric functions. So, for example, it is a good exercise to sit and check that uh, sin square z plus or rather let me write cos square z plus sin square z is equal to 1. That is just straightforward. You just have to plug in the formula above and check that it does get satisfied. Although the algebraic properties of uh, the real trigonometric functions do carry forward to the complex trigonometric functions, uh, I should note, I should mention here that the geometric properties do not carry forward in terms of angles and such things. Along the same lines as trigonometric functions, one could also define the hyperbolic trigonometric functions. Let me just define them directly, hyperbolic uh, trigonometric functions. So, let define the hyperbolic trigonometric functions cos h from c to c and sin h the hyperbolic sin and the hyperbolic cos from c to c given by sin h of I should start with cos h of z cos h of z is just equal to e to the power z plus e to the power minus z by 2. Let us now see how the hyperbolic sine and the hyperbolic cosine are related to the uh, complex sine and the complex uh, uh, cosine function we just defined. So, to do that let us consider cos of uh, i z. Let us see how the function cos of i z behaves. This is going to be equal to e to the power i z i times i z right. So, this is going to be e to the power minus of z uh, plus e to the power z by 2 and this is precisely equal to cos h of z. And how about sin i of z? Sin i z will be e to the power minus z minus e to the power um, z by 2 times i which is basically equal to minus of i times sin uh, h of z. So, sin h of z, oh no, there is no minus here, sin h of z is basically equal to minus of i times sin of uh, i z. I have freely used the fact that i square is equal to uh, minus 1. So, if you carefully notice, I hope I have not made a mistake, let us see. Yeah, that is right. So, the hyperbolic sign is obtained by some rotations of 90 degrees uh, because of the multiplication by i. I 
when you multiply by i, it's basically rotations by 90 degrees. So the sine and cosine, the sine is related to the hyperbolic sine by some rotations of 90 degrees. The hyperbolic cosine is related to the cosine function again by some rotations of 90 degrees. The hyperbolic uh, sine and cosine functions also have an analog of uh, all the algebraic properties that the complex sine and the complex cosine function satisfy. For example, so this is again an exercise, check that uh, cos h square z minus sin h square z is equal to 1. Right. So, the complex exponential uh, forms that uh, right framework which integrates the uh, trigonometric functions, the hyperbolic trigonometric functions, the real exponential uh, functions. It, it's giving, it's helping us give a very coherent theory. So, let me stop this lecture here.